Okay, is this working? Yeah. Yes, excellent. Hi everyone, um, thank you for having um, brunch with me today. Um, <laughs> a little southern grits, I'm very excited to experience. Um, before getting started, I wanted to um, say a couple words of thanks. Thanks to Jay Bolter for the great introduction. Um, thank you to Ann Pollock for the connection with GVU. Um, and a shout out of thanks to some old friends at Georgia Tech, um, Janet Murray and also Ian Bogost, who isn't here today. Um, I'm really excited to see everybody, um, some old friends in Atlanta this week. So um, I just sent a stack of cards that way, but please, um, Come by iDrum tomorrow night. Um, there's an exhibition. I'll show you some, um, a few images from this at the end of the talk, but um, we can. I'm happy to answer any questions and such um, as we go. So, um, the title of my talk today is Underhanded: Digital Digits, Manual Manipulation, and Non-Human Art. So I'm going to be tracing these themes um, through my artwork to show how I'm using art as a way to make an underhanded critique of digital culture. So the talk is going to be about 50 minutes, um, and we'll have some time for questions at the end. You can also certainly interrupt me at any point. Um, and I'm going to be showing you some images and um, playing some videos and reading a little bit as we go. So before we get into my artwork, I wanted to start off by posing a kind of underhanded comparison. Um, there's a lot one could say about these two images. Uh, on the left, we have what might be called a failed aspiration. And on the right, a trusty reminder. So Google Glass is or was a pre-released and decommissioned hands-free technology prematurely birthed out of a scandalous office place romance, which promised and defaulted to put elite explorers into real-time data driving, unfettered by fingers. Glass creates a type of mixed reality in which work and non-work become indistinguishable. As one possible orientation for today's talk, Glass represents for us the dream of hands-free a wearable technology that oddly forgets how the body handles the world, putting vision and voice above touch and tactility as the locus for command and control. On the right, we see a far more lowbrow example of a communicative technology, a bathroom sign. So while some might say that glass is shitty, this is signage that we often encounter in the unquestionably embodied context of excrement. This sign is a second possible orientation for our talk. It reminds us that our hands do our dirty work and that they are ever present, whether the work we're doing is producing or consuming or something in between. On one level, the sign's message is ostensibly geared toward manual workers, but it appears in restroom facilities frequented by producers and consumers alike, so on a second level, it sends an affective message of reassurance. In this way, it simultaneously signals conditions of trust, an implicit handshake, if you will, that crosses class privilege. The sticky fingered sign bridges not only class but also species. Reading between its lines, we find that we are holding hands with other human workers as well as with bacteria and germs. These kinds of interspecies relationships expose the precariousness of human exceptionalism, opening our awareness to the non human world. We are all dependent on working hands and what they touch, human and non-human, and rather than being bold explorers, we are all living literally and figuratively hand to mouth. In both of these images, both the dream of hands free and the reality of hand to mouth, the backdrop for our embodiment is labor. And so with this in mind, I'd like to dive in and talk about some of my artwork. Um, the first piece that I'd like to show is um, going to be underhanded in that it involves a sleeping computer. So um, this is a piece called Pipe Cleaner, and it is a cross-platform screensaver. 
some of you may recognize 3D Pipes, an old Microsoft Windows screensaver from the late 90s that I used as a setting for a sort of quirky post-feminist intervention. I inserted a pole dancer into the maze of pipes. So she's wearing a um, dress made out of cleaning gloves. And in addition to dancing, she's trying to clean and polish the pipes. So she's doing the same kind of maintenance work that the screensaver itself does, and that both of them are trying to keep your screen in good condition. Um, however, the pipe cleaning uh, pole dancers' spins and gyrations are edited in the same kind of absurd recombinant logic as the screensaver itself, and so she's continuously being trapped and overwritten by the pipes. In writing about this project, um, curator Jillian Hernandez said, quote, by reinserting the raced and gendered body back into the original screensaver, Behar exposes the ways in which digital technologies are pervasively coded as, quote unquote, masculine. So the screensaver hides an unspoken gender imbalance, and in this work I'm trying to expose that and make it explicit. In a nutshell, in a lot of my work, this piece and others, I find that digital subjects, and these could be human or non-human subjects, are oppressed and exploited by merely participating in digital culture. And that this kind of oppression and exploitation are analogous to ways that women and subaltern populations and the poor have been exploited under patriarchy, colonialism, and capitalism. So in a feminist tradition, a major theme in my artwork is to look at material practices in technoculture. My interest in working hands comes out because I'm especially interested in digital labor, in the excessive productivities generated by digital technologies, and in the physical work that technologies and people using them do. So one important aspect of this piece is that it's a screensaver. So unlike most artwork, it is not really meant for humans to look at, right? A screensaver is for the machine. It's something that plays on your screen when you've stepped away from the computer, right? So it's something that maybe at best you might catch out of the corner of your eye. It's something that you're, it's designed for you to ignore rather than to stare at. So in the process of making this piece, I learned that in the 19th century, prostitution in the US was discussed through a rhetoric of hygiene. So sex workers, like the pole dancer, were seen as a way of keeping men's dirty vices out of the home. So like flushing all the dirty stuff out into the street. Um, so pipes and plumbing were already gendered long before Microsoft's 3D pipes. Here, against the backdrop of plumbing, the employees must wash hand signs explicitly connects the kind of manual and affective labor that pervades through women's work. Uh, the next piece that I'd like to show, um, I'm putting my body on the line, on the command line, if you will, to try my hand at the work that a computer does when it's mixing color. So this, um, this piece is called Hexed. Color mixing in a computer is a pretty arcane and uninteresting activity. So in this project, I tried to reimagine this to make the process compelling and even a little bit mystical. Um, in Hexed, I perform as a cybernetic sorceress who divines color by typing. Hex refers both to the German word Hexen, which means um, a witch or to use black magic, and to hexadecimal codes, the six-digit alphanumeric codes that are used, among other things, for determining color on websites. So in the performance, I use a red divining rod and a red projected, uh, oops, this isn't advancing, okay. Um, a red, I'm using a red divining rod and a red projected laser keyboard. And I'm typing um, letters and numbers, and there's a computerized voice that repeats these as I'm typing them. So what I'm typing are commands to change the color of a projection that's aimed over my body. Um, I kind of wanted to go back to basics with this um, piece. And I was thinking about how being a visual artist, you know, I'm realizing that these slides are very washed out. Is it possible to turn out the overhead lights in the room to just, because it's hard to see things a little bit. Um, oh, thank you. Great. Uh, that's better. Okay. Thanks a lot. Um, so, um, 
Yes, so I was thinking about going back to basics here. I was thinking about how, um, in terms of being a visual artist in a maybe traditional sense, that you would think about that as being somebody who makes images who's in charge of color. And I was thinking about color mixing and, um, and paint as a process that is kind of cryptic and chemical at the same time. Um, and I was thinking about typing as a fundamental activity for computer users, that before the GUI was the command line. And then I was thinking in a very sort of silly way that if you imagine fingers typing at a keyboard and you take away the keyboard, it looks like somebody casting a magic spell, right? So um, these are some of the, the ideas. I think I'm going to skip the, the video for this piece. Um, uh, here we go. So. OK. Um, so the image of typing fingers at a keyboard right, is referenced in the media criticism of Willem Flusser, who writes about digital culture. In his essay on the non-thing, Flusser explains that we conventionally understand the hand as the organ by which Homo faber uh, manipulates the natural world, consuming nature to build tools and human culture. But digital culture is characterized for Flusser by a shift from things to information, or what he calls non-things. While we grasp things firmly with our hands, shaking them until the meanings rain out, this is this great image he uses, we apprehend information only by the touch of our fingertips, pressing buttons. Computer memory for Fluce is one of Flusser's examples of a non-thing. It is what he calls, quote, ephemeral and eternal at the same time. Non-things are not to hand like a tool, and yet they are handy. They are memorable. So I'd like to quote from Flusser at a little bit of length here, because I think what he's saying is quite profound. In his words, quote, in such a situation of non-things, there is nothing for the hands to get up and do. As this situation is impossible to grasp hold of, nothing in it is capable of being grasped, and nothing can be handled. In it, the hand, the grasping and productive act of handling, has become redundant. Whatever can still be grasped and produced is done automatically by non-things, by programs, by artificial intelligences and robotic machines. In such a situation, the human being has been emancipated from grasping and productive work. He has become unemployed. Unemployment today is not an economic phenomenon, but a symptom of the redundancy of work in a situation without things. Quite a quote, right? So for Flusser, the press of a button is an act of decision making. The fingertips are organs of choice or of decision. The human being, he says, is, quote, emancipated from work in order to be able to choose and decide. However, he notes that choice is limited in, to setting or not setting pre-programmed functions into action. So this binary freedom to choose in a world of information is not true freedom. And he warns that the society of the future without things may be split into two classes, those programming and those being programmed. So, this unsettling image of the programmers versus the program and of the physical versus the informational is reflected in the next project that I wanted to show you, which is called Compositions for Bit. This is an interactive art con uh, concert commemorating Bit, who is the first CGI movie character from Disney's 1982 cult classic movie, Tron. So in this piece, I'm again envisioning the inner life of machines. But this time, I wanted to take the audience there, too, by making it interactive and immersive, sort of like stepping onto the game grid in Tron, um, and seeing firsthand the kind of labor and effort that goes into flipping bits and exchanging electrical charges. Compositions for Bit was performed at Judson Church in 2010 on the day before the sequel, Tron Legacy, came out in theaters. So it's the culmination, it's a, it's a bit of an homage, but it's also the culmination of a long-standing obsession that I had with Bit. Um, so this is Bit, um, who's an animated polyhedron who becomes Jeff Bridges' pet and kind of bobs around his head saying yes and no and yes, 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 no, no, no. So. Um, Okay, 
So you get the idea. Um, so in Compositions for Bit, um, I created three larger than life sculptures of Bit. And inside each shape, there's a dancer who is wearing a costume that I designed with embedded Wiimote sensors. So the sensors allow the dancer's movements to, command, to control the sound and video um, projections. And then I invited three composers, Suzanne Thorpe, Shelley Bergen, and Sylvia Rizenka, to use these bits, meaning the unit of the shape, the dancer, and the Wiimote all together as musical instruments and ask them to make compositions for the bits to play as they flip by rolling around the room. So this was a concert with three movements, one by each composer. Each shape also had um, wireless fisheye cameras inside so the audience could see the dancers either by peering in through windows in the shapes um, or by watching video feeds that were projected behind the dancers um, on screens that I was live mixing. With, so it's footage from um, of the dancer and then mixing with footage from the movie and from the arcade game. So um, it's important to mention after this kind of um, in-depth technical explanation that when you were in this space, most people were not aware of the technology that was going on. So in some ways, very much like a movie, it was a kind of immersive, holistic experience for the audience. So Bit is the first CGI character in a movie, which is kind of a cool factoid that really inspired my thinking with the project. But also Bit taps into a moment when computers existed more as fantasy than as reality in our culture. If you think about it, Tron came out two years before the 1984 release of the Apple Macintosh, which popularized the GUI. So Tron was imagining a visual spatial language for computing before there actually was one. The movie was produced with a combination of computer generated and hand drawn animation. The kind of, now when we watch it today, we feel like it has this sort of very warm, um, handmade, hand drawn feel. Um, and even in its starkest geometric landscapes, there's this quaint feeling of human imagination and handcraft. In the narrative of Tron, the Jeff Bridges character is digitized and gets sucked into a computer where he must survive the digital environment of a video game. I'm inverting that logic in this project by remaking Tron's computer-generated bit by hand, bigger, uh, larger than life, and bringing the digital character out into the human realm. Um, so, the next piece that I'd like to show talks about generational overturn um, in planned obsolescence by enacting a, hu a non-human love affair between two machines. This is 3G56K. It's an interactive technology and performance installation. So I made a 12-foot iPhone with a functioning touch screen that performers and or audience members could dance or walk around on and dial numbers. So when you dialed a number, the signal would travel through this big um, rubber hose over to the iPhone's love interest, which was the dial-up modem inside this big pink uh, tower computer. So the modem would then place a call and print out a page of a fax, a thermal fax, um, that would produce a long scrolling image of the rubber hose. So here is a short video of the installation to give you an idea.
Okay. <laughs> so um, this piece is really an intergenerational love affair between a contemporary at the time, iPhone, and an obsolete dial-up modem. Besides having an intergenerational thing going on, just like my own iPhone, which at the time liked wearing black leather, these machines are dressed in fetish wear. So they've got lots of vinyl and rubber and zippers. An important part of this piece is that the humans in this relationship end up getting reduced to the role of fluffers who are just really there to try to get these machines to connect. This is a user unfriendly interface that isn't really designed with humans in mind because without numbers on the screen, people are really just dialing blind. So in fact, there was, as one would predict, a lot of crank calling. And every time a nonsense number was dialed, we redirected the number to Apple headquarters. <laughs> so, a beautiful unplanned aspect of this project was that when you call Apple, a human doesn't answer the phone. It's a computer. So there was a frustrated conversation going on between the two computers where Apple's automatic uh, voice directory system kept trying and failing to get a response from the modem in 3G56K, and Apple's computerized voice kept saying things like, I'm having a hard time understanding you. <laughs> so, ordinarily, machines do the bidding of humans. And here I'm putting humans in the service of machines. So it's a role reversal, kind of lending a hand to give the machines a break. This kind of cooperation gets us ready to think, to rethink, that is, a handful of terms. Hands free, hands off, hand off, hand over, hand over hand, the artist's hand, modeling clay, modeling data, indexicality, tap and swipe, a human touch, touch ID, handy features, you're handy with that, Zuhandenheit, readiness to hand, she's a handful, Vorhandenheit, presence at hand, prosthetics, robotics, palm reader, can you handle it? Put a ring on it, hand in hand, handiwork, handicraft, handmade, handshake, lend a hand, let's give a big hand, manual labor, remote office, hand to hand combat, hands up don't shoot, all hands on deck, look ma no hands. Historically, I am not the first woman to embody being a computer. And in fact, before computers were computers, computers were women. In the 1940s, a computer wasn't a thing, it was a job. So computers were people who performed computation. Bakers bake, teachers teach, computers compute. Computing was a monotonous form of number crunching. It was a kind of clerical work that was usually done by women, both because there were more women available to work during World War II, and because of cultural assumptions that women were more suited to this kind of mindless tedium. And in fact, women were considered ideal computers from the late 18th century. This slide shows women computers working on tabulating data. Here are two women computers working with the ENIAC machine, which is the first general purpose electronic computer. And this incredible image shows a male programmer issuing commands to a female computer, which is very persistent imagery that we see again in updated form, for example, in the 2013 Spike Jones movie, Her. So my work recognizes this material historical connection between working bodies and the computer because one of the things that I'm most concerned with is the labor required for techno-social processes that uphold a digital culture to run. And what these images show is that there's a feminist concern here too in the link between the invisible black box labor of the machine and the invisibility of women's work. And here we could think back to how the screensaver's maintenance work is not meant for our eyes. Um, in the same spirit, 
I would like to show you the next piece um, is a storefront installation that I created last summer for the Brunswick Window, which is a Jersey City venue curated by Roger Sayer. Um, this installation is titled High Hopes, and it features a Roomba with a rubber tree strapped to its back, vacuuming to the tune of Frank Sinatra's song High Hopes. The Roomba is programmed to, for, to perform the same fortitude as the little ant in Sinatra's song, who teaches children to keep trying against all odds. So here's a video of that um, installation. and hexed, I try to perform a non-human machine's process. But in high hopes, the machine performs what is traditionally human's work, the gendered activity of vacuuming. So this piece bridges feminist and post-colonial critique of technology. I'm also interested in the modernist colonial enterprise, and specifically slavery, as a supply mechanism to provide labor power. I consider how contemporary digital tools and gadgets are robots in the etymological sense of the word, meaning forced labor. So um, this is a, these are images from RUR, Rossum's Universal Robots, a play by Carl Kepek, um, which coined the term robot from a Czech root, um, which means forced labor or serf labor or servitude. A common complaint of digital culture is to say that we are slaves to the machine. But I'm also looking at how machines are slaves to us and what that says about human ethics, especially as we humanize these machines like in the movie Her. So while the work of vacuuming and certainly the class aspirational home decor of this piece are both gendered, this piece also references um, post-coloniality. Last fall, I presented this project as part of a Femtech Net class led by Lisa Nakamura and Irina Urstarkova at the University of Michigan. Eliza Cadeau, a student in that class, gave a brilliant response to the project using the rubber tree as a point of departure. The rubber tree reminded her of cruel practices in Congolese rubber plantations. The colonialists would cut off the hands of underproductive workers in order to, fo to force the most productive workers to work doubly hard to support their family members as well as themselves. Cadeau drew a connection between this literally under handed form of slave labor and the dream of hands-free labor sublimated today in the Roomba, which in this piece nevertheless bears a rubber tree as a burden. This connection to women's technologized work and post-colonial politics are main themes for disorientalism and interdisciplinary collaboration between myself and Marianne M. Kim. We've been working together on this project since 2000 and, uh, 2005, and our work includes public performances, video, lenticular photography, an interactive book, a video game, and much, much more. So in all of our projects, we study the disorienting effects of technologized labor, throwaway junk culture, and consumerism. Disorientalism is a made-up word, but we're sending a shout out to Edward Said's famous book, Orientalism, in which he talked about how identifying the other is a way of orienting one's power for those in power. For us, who are not in power, identifying is a hop, skip, and a jump away from mistaken identity. So it's got the power to be deeply disorienting. 
We think of our identities as what we produce and consume and what produces and consumes us at all times. So it's constantly getting mixed up. This is a short clip from a video by Disorientalism called Plugging Away. It's a piece um, that's dealing with labor and the play between the natural and the man-made. This is just a 30, uh, sorry, this is a one minute clip from a five minute video. So this is an early project of disorientalisms, and we've made quite a bit of work over the years. But today I'll show you just one more piece, um, sort of fast forwarding to the current series that we're working on called The Food Groups. Um, and I thought I'd show this um, to you guys because it involves video games. So. Um, the Food Groups is a series of five installations about erasing the distinction between the depersonalized production and the very personalized promotion of industrial food. We're assuming the identities of these five characters from mid-century American mass-produced food. Wendy of Wendy's Old Fashioned Hamburgers, Aunt Jemima, the Land O'Lakes Indian Maiden, Sun Made Raisin Girl, and Chiquita Banana. So this is our installation brown bagging about Wendy. The room is filled with over 600 hand-stamped brown paper bags and cacophonous sound from a lot of media is playing simultaneously. The centerpiece of the installation is called Participation May Vary. It's an interactive Kinect video game that we made in collaboration with game designers Chen Zenka. And there are three short videos that are also playing in the background. This piece is about the gamification of labor, in which through play one accomplishes work that can be capitalized upon for profit. We were interested in the confusion between the affective labor of play and the physical labor of factory work, and we wanted to show that affective labor, which means the labor that produces feelings instead of commodities, is also physical. So in the game, you work in Wendy's Brown Bag Factory, but instead of doing the repetitive tasks associated with boring factory work, like flipping burgers or checking widgets, you have to do all of the fun repetitive tasks that are codified in gaming. Things like jumping again and again and picking things up over and over. And in between shifts, lest you become too tired to be a productive worker, you have to learn Tai Chi to relax and restore your energy level so that you're ready to work your next shift. So there were also three, um, oh, here, I can show you. Sorry, I forgot this was in here. I'll just uh, sort of move through this. So this is the first, the fir turn this down a little bit. Okay, this is the first level where you have to jump until you um, clear, oh, here we go. Sorry, I'm having mouth issues. There we go. Um, so you have to jump until you bounce all of the bags off of the, um, off of the factory floor, and then relax. Go make more work energy. Then you have to go make energy. So you have to do this Tai Chi thing where, so there's this motif of the red dot that's one of Wendy's freckles that's come loose and becomes her chi ball of energy. And you have, to, you have dots on your hands and feet and you have to line them up with these dots that appear to try to put you into, um, into the Tai Chi poses, which is actually much harder than it looks. This is, that's Ben who's playing right now, who's one of the developers who is very good at it. It's actually really hard. Um, so you do this and then um, the next level is sort of based on Pikmin. You pick up, um, it's like gleaning in the, t the ketchup factory, but instead of picking up um, tomatoes, you're picking up ketchup bottles, like our, our tomato plants drop ketchup bottles. Um, so you have to pick 
these things up and then um, you have to do, we took all of these from fortune cookies, so um, you then have to do more <laughs> Tai Chi. Um, so <laughs> you're just relaxing in the, in the, outside the factory, there's a gorgeous meadow. And then in the last level, this is your chance to liberate yourself from work and it's based on Katamari. So you have to try to push this ball um, to roll up all of the things in the previous um, level and eventually you start to roll up um, chunks of the factory itself so you're kind of breaking free from the factory and um, you know uh, liberating yourself from your drudgery um, and once you get to the end of this level um, ideally you've reached nirvana and um, yeah here we go yeah so that's J Wendy's head tells you that you get like a week off if you do really well so um, and then we'll see you in Monday um, so that's these are some videos that were also part of it. This is a video called Biggie in which we're contending with a very large um, paper bag on a country road. And this is everyday value. This is our gleaning again. Um, we're gleaning ketchup bottles in the tomato hothouse. And this is Deluxe Double, which I'll play for you now, in which we try to tame our unruly chi energy. So, um, in my work with disorientalism, we appropriate from junk culture. And one thing that this collaboration has taught me is to look at all artifacts of technoculture and mass produce uh, a culture as mass produced junk. So, high tech junk is just junk that enters circulation at a higher price point than the junk that you find in the 99 cent store or the junk food in a Wendy's value meal. Tech junk is easier to identify as plain old junk when it becomes obsolete, but it's all just junk. Um, I think in the interest of time, because I want to make sure that we have some time for questions, I'm going to skip this next um, bit and fast forward to the end. What's happening? Okay. There we go. That's, that's a sneak peek, you can come and see that at the gallery. Um, okay, so we're nearing the end and I wanted to wrap up by showing you um, some things that you'll see on Friday if you come out to iDrum. So um, the exhibition, again, just to plug it, hopefully you've all gotten postcards. Um, the correct date is Friday, tomorrow the 3rd, not Saturday the 3rd. Um, and the opening is 7 to 11. So um, I'm gonna show you um, so this, the exhibition is called E-Waste, and I premiered this work last November at the Tesca Center for Contemporary Art at the University of Kentucky. And what I'm gonna be showing you now is some documentation from that version of the exhibition. So you'll see some similar things and some different things when you come out on, um, on Friday. So in this project, um, like in Disorientalism's work, I'm using narrative, but I'm giving it a sort of non-human angle here. So the point of departure for e-waste is a science fictional scenario in which plastic USB devices have survived an ecological apocalypse. 
Um, although they no longer have humans to program them, they are destined to work forever. So even as their bodies become slowly fossilized, they keep churning. This piece is called Prologue, and it's a small Android tablet that plays a scrolling text video, which is a short sci-fi scene. Um, rather than playing you the video, which is a little bit long, I'm gonna just read the text as I go through a few of these images. The factories finally grow so large that the planet can no longer support their weight. It starts with a simple sinkhole in Shenzhen. Eroded beaches pile onto deforested mountainsides. Slums crumble over condos, sloshed in ice cap runoff, and the continent slips. It isn't long before neighboring nuclear reactors are swallowed and the inevitable rest is history. Soon, Earth is no longer habitable for humans. But what of all the gadgets those factories churned out, the always-on armies that once served the human race? Their plastic bodies prove impervious to eventual climate change and sudden catastrophe. Indeed, they hastened this. But without humans to program them to direct their work and give them purpose, the devices persist in their empty routines. As years go by, the earth beneath them takes pity. The stony ground creeps toward the orphaned gadgets, embracing their fragile frames to soothe and brace them for their burden of infinite work. So e-waste deals not only with the labor of machines, but also with the environmental impact of the kinds of cheap throwaway technology that I'm interested in. Thinking back to Flusser's essay on the non-thing, he notes that the non-thing undermines the ideal of linear progress by which hands supposedly manipulate nature, transforming the natural into the cultural. Instead, informational non-things expose the cycle through which we proceed from nature to culture to waste, which becomes nature again. Flusser writes, the human, quote, the human hand consumes culture and transforms it into waste. The human being is surrounded not by two worlds then, but by three, of nature, of culture, and of waste. It is a circle turning from nature to culture, from culture to waste, from waste to culture, and so on, a vicious cycle. In e-waste, I'm interested in how this cyclical malleability of categories undermines human intentionality. This is especially crucial to understand against the backdrop of our un, under, and over-employed hands and fingers because I think that there are parallels between the contemporary compulsion to work 24-7 that's exacerbated by things like social media where we ourselves are always on, and the idea that like these devices, like earlier robotic or colonial slaves, humans are disposable in a global digital economy of this scale. In this context, my work aims to create sympathetic human-machine systems as a counterpoint to coercive cybernetic systems. I'm interested in fomenting human-non-human -human camaraderie, a goal that's very much aligned with and indeed inspired by feminist ideology. So another piece in this installation is 3D and and. It's a fossilized 3D printer that slowly produces scarab covers for a network of glowing USB mouses. This piece crosses the archaeological and the futuristic, digital and handcrafted reproduction, and animate and inanimate agency. It gets right into the question of the hand in non-human art. Where do hands touch the making of this artwork? Anna Watkins Fisher has written about the issues this project raises. About this work, she writes, quote, the questions of human versus non-human reproduction apparent in the artist's sculptural work are extended to the exhibition's 3D printer installation. Its own form fossilized much like Behar's sculptures, the quote-unquote organic printer spits out organic computer mouse fossils, literally bringing into form the mutual imprinting of organic and non-organic life. 
Echoing her choice to use Magic Sculpt, a plastic material that hardens to, as, so as to mimic clay instead of actual clay, the printer installation poses the question, can mechanical reproducibility be considered part of a natural process? Make no mistake, Behar is interested in the natural appearance of the artificial. So the process behind 3D and and contributes to these seeming contradictions. Originally, I made a handmade model of what I wanted the scarab cover to look like. But of course, because I made it by hand, it was slightly imperfect. So I made it as close to perfect as I could. The printer was then programmed to create perfect digital copies of my imperfect handmade model, capturing its analog imperfections. But this gets more interesting because it turns out that the printer is no perfect robotic worker. Rather, over the course of this, the show, a growing mound of imperfect scarab shells shows how unpredictable and irregular it actually is. The promise of 3D printing that we hear in the news, that it's about instantaneous democratic production, is also undercut by the slowness of this process. Far from rapid prototyping, the printer moves painstakingly slowly, gradually excreting each print. So each scarab takes about six hours to print. Um, the, the final scarabs further reference the human hand and its removal in that the sectional patterns of the 3D uh, printer's layered excretions start to look like the arches, whorls, and loops of a human fingerprint. During this project, I worked with students at the University of Kentucky who helped me to augment the printer with additional motors so that all the while that it's printing, its motors are chirping out plaintive messages in Morse code. 3D and and is searching for its origins, calling out mommy, daddy in Morse code. So I'd like to end by showing you one of the videos from my series, which was also in this show. Um, so this is, uh, the series is called Modeling Big Data, and in it I'm performing four data gestures, um, buffering, clicking, pinging, and caching. So this is a six channel um, installation at the University of Kentucky. And um, one of the things that Anna Watkins Fisher points out is that modeling, of course, is also to perform. So this, here's a video, it's um, just under two minutes long. This one is clicks. So that's all I've got. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you, Catherine, for that fascinating uh, presentation of your work in which we learned, among many other things, that the brown bag can be an object of art. <laughs> <laughs> and now I think we have some time for a few minutes at least for questions, so uh, please uh, raise your hand and, and just report them directly. 
Great, yeah. Uh, uh, thanks for a great talk. Uh, Thank you. For taking us through your uh, really interesting work. Uh, I love your invocation of this. Okay. <laughs> I think there is a line, uh, you know, in the future without things, humanity will exist only by its fingertips, right? Right. And, but there's something really interesting going on in your work. Uh, I was especially struck in the, uh, uh, the Wendy's, in the Wendy game, the, uh, the brown bag project, where you're sort of, you have players who are existing by bodily gesture, Right? So it's not that the body has been removed as with Google Glass or the hands have been removed, but that but now the things that are being worked on by the hands are virtual. Right? Mm -hmm. So that mm -hmm. so that the hands are still operative, right? The body's still operative, but what's being worked on is no longer physically there. And I'm wondering just what you think as as you know, there are all these projects for augmented reality like the HoloLens, mm -hmm. and the virtual reality like Oculus Rift. What's, what's going to happen as our handiwork is working on things that aren't there? So that right. Our hands right. Yeah. Right. That's such a great reading of it. Right. So that it becomes almost like an empty hand. Right. So that you're still retaining these the gestures of physicality, but that you're operating on. I mean, that, that's the non-thing, right? You're operating on nothing with your hands. So I think, you know, Flusser is so interesting for me because, um, because he's writing um, at a time when, so he's, the, these pieces, I don't have the exact date, I think it's in the 90s, basically. Um, but he's writing about, you know, he's sort of writing with a lot of warnings, but he's very perceptive and prescient, really, about digital culture. I really think, you know, I, I'm so stuck on his name of these, this is a pair of essays that's called The Non-Thing One and The Non-Thing Two. And I'm so stuck on this idea of the non-thing because that I actually totally disagree with. Like, I'm really interested in things and interested in objects. So these kinds of contradictions, like the physical gesture, the physical um, performance without the thing, or the object that persists as information, right? Because of course, you know, like, the giant iPhone or the giant dial-up modem, it's like this seemingly virtualizing technology that has an enormous footprint, right? Um, these, are, like, these are all of the contradictions that I'm quite interested in. So yeah, I have, I have questions about the idea of the non-thing and the idea of like, what will we grasp in these gestures? Yeah, thank you. Other, other, oh, yep. I guess, so I also really enjoyed the picture. Thank you. Um, and so I was also interested in this Wendy's part, in particular about the Tai Chi stuff and in, in, in inserting the Tai Chi in uh -huh. very um, interesting context and things. And I was curious if you thought about like these biofeedback and what role that might play. It's also kind of like this unseen work that the body is doing in the background that kind of fits with the whole theme of like bringing some of this work that happens in the infrastructure to the surface in a different way for the user. So I'm just curious what your thoughts might be on biofeedback. Yeah, I think biofeedback is a really great example. Um, it's almost, uh, you know, here we're using um, the Tai Chi is like super tongue in cheek, obviously, like the whole project. Um, but biofeedback, I think, is so interesting because it really gets at the way that you can think about um, organic and inorganic systems as being um, comparable, right? So that we can understand the body as electric. Um, we can understand um, our devices as electric, and that allows us to begin to play with some of these um, category confusions that I'm really interested in. So I think that's a great, it's a great um, idea. I've never worked with biofeedback, but we'd be very interested to play around. Yeah, thank you. Other um, comments, questions? Jay, thank you. Naive question in a certain sense, but when you are uh, conceiving of, a, of one of these media pieces mm -hmm. and you have so many different um, you know, media at your disposal, how do you do you conceive of the piece uh, from the beginning with a particular technological expression? Mm -hmm. Is it conceptual first? Yeah. Um it's, I really, it depends. I work in so many different ways. It really depends on the project. I do, um, 
I'm sort of a, a strange artist in that I get a lot of my inspiration from reading theory. <laughs> I'm a big nerd. Um, so a lot of times I'm reading something, some text, and I get an image in my head, and then I start trying to make that physically. Often what happens, I mean, as you can see in my work, I work with programmers sometimes, but I myself am not a programmer. Um, and I'm really interested in the process of starting with an idea, starting to try to make it, and then encountering some sort of unforeseen um, problem, right? So usually when I'm making something, the material world does not do my bidding, right? So often I have some sort of situation where the object talks back as it were, and I start to, almost dialogue in the creation of, of um, the work with the materials that I'm working with. So sometimes something that I thought was going to be a sculpture turns into a video, or something that I thought was going to be um, you know, a video turns into a live performance, or something like this. So um, often I'm, I'm really sort of working around the, the things that, that I'm I'm playing around with when I start building. I think that one, this is a real difference. I, I, a lot of my close friends and collaborators are programmers, and this is a real difference um, from the way that I work and the way that a lot of computer programmers work because often with, um, I mean, of course, as you all probably know very well, debugging is a huge part of coding. And there's a part of debugging that is really about problem solving. And I'm sort of interested in problem making, you know? So if you have broken code that doesn't do what you thought you wanted it to do, it just doesn't work, right? There's not sort of, you have to either approach the problem a different way or fix the problem. And I'm interested in kind of making the problem bigger often. Yeah. Other, uh, yes? Hi. So I really liked what you said about effective labor being very physical. I think it mm -hmm. really like some tier intersectional approach um, particularly for people with disabilities. Uh -huh. um, I was wondering how do you sort of incorporate intersectionality? You said you talked a little bit about how you inform your work theory. Mm -hmm. um, so how do I, the que sorry, the question is how do I incorporate the theory with intersectionality? So I mean for me I think um, yeah, I, for me, I think that in some ways there is, um, as an artist, I think that I'm, all of these interests for me are really um, deeply intertwined in a lot of ways. So um, something that, you know, like the, the feminist theory in my work, for example, absolutely, um, you know, I am, I am the, I am, the product of my gendered cultural uh, position as well as the product of my racial cultural position as well as the product of my um, sort of vocational position, right? So I think that all of these things are really intertwined and a lot of what, I mean intersectionality in general I think um, ideally comes through strongly in artwork where we're trying to put together a lot of meanings into one um, into one object or one experience. So I guess that's not entirely sure how to answer that question, but that's, that's kind of my best shot. Yes? So I got a question about like, how do you define non-human? Because for mm. these computers, programs, they are artifacts. So mm -hmm. can communication happens between a person and a machine? So is it really like <coughs> human and human? Like they are communicating with each other or a person is talking to Programmer that. Oh, that's interesting. I mean, for me, I would say that the person is talking to um, to the well. I would see. I would see the program also as being a non-human thing. You know, so I would say that the the software itself can also be considered a non-human object. Yeah. Like, for example, in the movie Her, uh -huh. it's like like that like, girl is made by human, right? Made by human beings. Right, I mean, I think in that, in that movie, 
she, like the software is made, it's, I mean, the, one of the things that's interesting in that movie, right, so the software is made by a um, human programmer ostensibly, right, and then it grows complex in a way that supersedes um, that kind of origin, right? So. Um, the, this sort of artificial intelligence aspect of the operating system gets way smarter than any human was or could be, right? Yeah, I just doubt whether that happen. Well, it's a movie. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, but I think that there are, you know, there are examples of, you know, complexity in software, right? So, um, so. Although we're unlikely, I mean, I feel like this is like spoiler alert, but um, although that particular narrative may be relatively unlikely, uh, <laughs> I think that there are certainly examples where, you know, some simple, you know, uh, Conway's game of life, right? So there's very simple rules and then a complex um, system emerges out of that that's, that is um, beyond what could be predictable by the person who wrote the rules. So, there, yeah. Thanks. I think it's uh, we're at time. Yeah. Hour, so we'll, we'll thank Catherine very much for the presentation and uh, thank you for your time. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.